a lot of it is over by the time that officer gets there. We outline a, a case in the book, which was really fascinating to us. We interviewed a school principal. It was not a heavy-handed response necessarily that prevented the shooting. It was an existing relationship between the school principal and the student that enabled him to sort of say, you're not going to do this today. I know who you really are, and you're not going to do this today. And that helped prevent what could have been an awful tragedy uh, at that particular school. Izzy Azagwi was a decorated squad commander in Israeli Defense Forces. He is the only soldier in the world who lost an arm in combat and returned to the battlefield. I'm really interested to talk to you about this whole situation. Now, you're an American, right? Mm -hmm. And you were living where when you were 18, 17, 18, going to high school and all? I grew up in, in Miami. For your bar mitzvah, you went to Israel, correct? That's correct. I went to Israel for my bar mitzvah. It was during the, uh, the second intifada. And so when you made that trip, you went with, was it just you and your parents? Uh, and my sister, yeah. It was a small family trip. Okay. When you were there, you met some Israeli soldiers, correct? Yeah, they're always out and about uh, traveling home from, from base. It's a very small country, so you see them everywhere. You met and talked to some of these guys. Tell me about that and what impact it had on you. Uh, the impact that I had meeting soldiers didn't happen when I was, was 13. It actually happened when I was 18. It was the second time that I had gone, had gone back. Um, what impacted me most as a 13-year-old in Israel was having narrowly avoided the infamous Sabaro bombing. There was a pizzeria uh, that was blown up when I was there, uh, and we had just passed that intersection uh, shortly beforehand. So uh, it there was were my like first. Fifteen people killed, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, fifteen, uh, somewhere around fifteen people killed, many more wounded, and it was kind of just looping on the news. Uh, and I was sitting, sitting huddled with my family in the hotel room. Uh, watching footage of that. Uh, and that was really the first time that it dawned on me that I uh, would maybe want to participate in not allowing that to happen again in the future. Even at 13, you thought about that? Looking back, that was like the first kernel um, that, that uh, led to me volunteering for the IDF. But yeah, it was when I was 18 and I, I got to like actually meet soldiers who were my age, essentially my peers who were doing something very different than I was at that age that really pushed me to actually follow through. Yeah. And how long after that second trip was it before you actually joined the military? It was less than a year. That's really an unusual thing. You're an American, you're living in Miami, and you go to Israel and join the armed forces over there. That's a big step. It's unusual. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd. Uh, I grew up playing video games. I don't like not showering and spending days on end in the dirt without proper food. But um, the the idea of protecting the Jewish people was a compelling enough reason to push against who I am um, and take that leap. What'd your parents think about that? Uh, it's interesting because uh, because their reaction to my original joining of the military was I think more the stereotype, which is that my father was worried, but very proud. I think his, his pride overtook any fear of something happening. And my mother uh, just cried. She, she cried endlessly uh, leading up to, to that first time she watched me leave on the bus. Um, and that changed uh, quite dramatically later on, but we can get to that uh, juxtaposition later. We can hold off. And so how long had you been in when you sustained your injury? The very day that I had finished training, um, which was about nine and a half months into my service, that very day we were sent home on our final weekend leave before we were going to be activated as combat soldiers. And it was that weekend that war broke out on the border of Gaza and my unit was sent there. So the first thing that I saw out of training uh, was that operation. This is 
January 8th, 2009. So this is your first day out of training. Yep. Thrown right into it. This was a really big mortar shell that landed near you. And you lost not just an arm, but your dominant arm, correct? Yep. 120 millimeter mortar landed less than a foot away from me. Uh, It has, I believe, a 30 meter kill zone. And there was more than one of them that landed within that zone. We found helmets that were split in half. Uh, three, Three fellow soldiers were wounded alongside me and miraculously none of us uh, were were killed in action. Uh. Russia is the number one nuclear power in the world. Some sources say they have close to 6,000 nuclear warheads, 1,600 of them believed to be deployed. The United States has about 5,500, about 1,600 of which are deployed. Russia's stockpile is growing. The United States' stockpile is shrinking. Doesn't matter what the exact numbers are. What we know is they are a nuclear superpower. And they have hundreds and hundreds of these nuclear warheads deployed with the ability to launch them from the sea, the air, and the ground. There is no room for error here. If you look at this from a worldview, when you look at this from the psychological standpoint of Vladimir Putin, and he is allowed to invade a democratic republic and get away with it, then what happens next? Now, The question is, how self-destructive is he? Well, who knows? I don't think anybody knows that. And trust me, the United States government has a department that does nothing but study Vladimir Putin every time he's on camera. They look to see what's his gait. Does he look bloated that day? Are his eyes red? Is his syntax changed? Is he slurring any words? Is the cadence of what he's saying different? Are his eye movements different? Look at his pupils. Is there anything that suggests a shift in his mentality, in his mental health, in his stress levels, in his health levels? in the color of the sclera in his eyes, anything that would suggest that he is ill, that he is mentally ill, anything. When you have someone that is an autocrat that has their finger on the button, you watch this person very closely to see if you're seeing the prodromal, the lead up to any kind of illness. He is watched very closely. I've given you my view of a small sampling of things. We have a department of this government, I promise you, that's not publicized, that studies this guy every second he's on tape to look for baselines and then variants from baselines. Is Putin really psychotic, evil, power-hungry, and a madman? Or is this just media hype to advance some political agenda to justify something that's going on? I'm going to tell you, obviously, I don't know Vladimir Putin. I've not evaluated him, and unlike some professionals that have no problem rendering a diagnosis on someone they've never evaluated, tested, interacted with, or whatever, I can't do that. Wish I could, but I can't. I don't have x-ray vision. But what I can do, which I think is extremely valuable, is this. I study body language. I've spent a lot of time doing that in working with juries. I've spent time vertically developing that skill. It is a science. There's a lot behind it. And it came in particularly useful in this situation because I don't even almost speak Russian. Not even almost. I have had the benefit of having some really good translations of some of the tapes that I've looked at early on leading up to this conflict with the buildup, and also fairly recently. Now, some of the translations are 
things that aren't maybe as precise as others, but some of them have come from really good sources, really good Russian translators, so I have great confidence in those. And I've been assisted in this and been given access to some of these by my good friends and colleagues at Behavior Panel. And if this is one of the sites that you don't follow, I highly recommend that you subscribe and do now. They have a two-hour and I think 36-minute program up right now on YouTube analyzing Vladimir Putin and with great examples explaining why they think what they think. They're colleagues of mine. They're good friends of mine. We've talked about this. We've collaborated on it and spent time on it. And they do that with really critical interviews. So I highly recommend it. I have the greatest respect in the world for these professionals. I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in a minute because they've been a great resource for me on this, and we've exchanged ideas about it. So I can't diagnose him, and you know I'm not into labels anyway, but let me tell you what I see. What I see in his behavior, his syntax, his conduct, is this is an individual that at times, and I'm going to talk about which ones, but at times is seething anger. He's showing signs of what I refer to as savior behavior. This is important because he believes that he is a savior of the Russian people, not just the people in Russia, and he is a true believer. This is not something that he's just saying in the media to have something to say to justify what he's doing. 30-plus percent of ethnic Russians are in the Ukraine. And I believe that he has convinced himself to the core of his soul that he is going in there to remove the folks that are persecuting them. So think about this. He does not believe that he is just invading another country and going on a land grab, a resource grab, just trying to rebuild something. He believes he is a savior. And trust me, people with a savior complex are self-righteous, and that makes them dangerous. And there are 30-plus percent ethnic Russians in Ukraine, and he has convinced himself, I am going to save my people. And he shows many true believer attributes by branding the bad guys. Here's a problem. The bad guys, they're Ukrainian and the United States. Because we represent the same thing in terms of a democratic republic. Something that's dangerous here is there are ethnic Russians in all former USSR nations. So is he going to go save them next? Where does it stop? Now, what do I base this on? The way he communicates. Now, as I said, I've got good translations for what he's saying, so I'm having to read this in subtitles and listen to the translations, which are someone else speaking his words. So I can't give any weight to that or what it means. I just have to take the words themselves, not the emphasis of the syntax of the words, but the actual words he speaks. But there are certain emphatic illustrators, the way that he uses his hands, and there are certain things that you'll sometimes see people do where they categorize things, like the old Ben Franklin T where you do pros and cons, pros and cons. This is good. This is bad. This is good. This is bad. And they'll speak where certain things are emphasized. There's only one asymmetric emotion 
out of all emotions expressed on the face. And there are a lot of ways to describe it, but it is disgust, it is disdain, it's dismissive, it's this superior sort of dismissal and superior disgust towards something. He uses that when he's talking about kind of the senior partner in the situation, and that's the United States. And you only see this when he's talking about the Ukraine and the United States out of everything else he's talking about. There are other times that he's talking where he kind of slumps down in his chair, puts his hands on the table, his voice drops. But when he's talking about the Ukraine, when he's talking about the United States, he gets very animated with his body language and in his voice. He is a true believer. And this adds up to the fact that this guy actually believes that he is the victim here. He is wronged. His country is wrong. Bakari Sellers made history in 2006. At just 22 years old, he defeated a 26-year incumbent state representative to become the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in the nation. It really bothers me when I see even something like tragically happened in Uvalde where we had 19 students killed, two teachers, and then recently one of the teacher's husbands died of a heart attack, maybe related, I can imagine, with the stress. I'm watching that. I don't even know which channel it was, but I start hearing people from both sides of the aisle using it to politicize issues of gun control and whether the governor of the state is doing enough of this or enough of that. There's time for that. But in the meantime, we've got people down there that are really hurting and need resources and help. And it just really is offensive to my sensibilities to see people getting up on their hind legs and running an agenda on top of that. I hate to see that. I would push back on the framing of that <clears throat> because I would, I would, my pushback would be that when is the time to have these conversations? And people always say, well, you know, the bodies are still, they're still warm. And as someone who lived through a mass shooting, um, you know, one of my good friends I write about at Clemente Pinckney was the pastor at Mother Emanuel AME Church and, um, you know, him along with eight others. I mean, they, they like, like in Buffalo, I, I would just say they, he, you know, Dylan Roof took the best of us. He didn't, he walked into a church doing Bible study and shot nine people. Um, Tragic. When do you, when do you have these conversations? And what I resent more than the, uh, you know, politicization or whatever you may call it is the do nothingness. Um, because we've had, you know, you, you had people forget we had the largest mass shooting in the history of the world um, in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, right. in the, the concert. We've had Parkland. We've had Sandy Hook. We've had, we've had Fort Hood. We've had Charleston. I mean, the list of mass shootings, school shootings goes on and on and on. And so I, I understand the space needed to grieve. I mean, we're still grieving in, in Charleston, and it happened in 2015. But what frustrates me more is the, the do-nothingness of our quote-unquote leaders on both sides of the aisle. Well, I agree that nothing has been done, and this is a matter of coming up with a model of prevention, not intervention. But I'll push back on your pushback <laughs> and say people deserve their space in that moment. Let's at least give them center stage and space because, as you point out, what's been done? Does three to five days make a difference? I think, based on results, it hasn't. So we can at least be respectful of those that are hurting instead of interrupting press conferences and beating on the drum. How about instead? We actually get some meaningful legislation. We actually get a plan of prevention that should 100% be bipartisan. This doesn't have anything to do with the Second Amendment. 
everybody frames it that way, but it doesn't have anything to do with Second Amendment. You will not get an argument from me out of that. I'm a concealed weapons permit holder. I'm a, I'm a Democrat from South Carolina, which uh, doesn't make me the most liberal Democrat in the world. I got my, I got my CWP. I was in a class with Nikki Haley, of, of all people, one of my good friends who were actually from the same small county in Bamberg, South Carolina. And so I, I, I get all of that. I, I understand it, and it should be. But you have to have something to get 60 votes. And, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be extremely blunt with you, Dr. Phil. And I think that's why people some I mean, whether or not people like me or not, I think they always respect my truth. But when um, 20 white kids were killed in Sandy Hook and we did absolutely nothing, our country became so desensitized to that. It became so normalized when we did nothing after Sandy Hook. I was completely um, jaded by the thoughts that anything would happen in the future. And so I was speaking to a colleague today at CNN and I said, um, it's very difficult to be a, a new parent. My, my 16 year old is my, my stepchild and my three year old, of course, are mine. But it's very difficult to go through this this uh, phase of sending your kid to school because, you know, it's going to happen again. Your prayer has to be that it doesn't happen to your children. And that is an anxiety-inducing moment. Well, it is. There were 61 active shooters on campus in 2021. That's more than one a week. I mean, and you think about this kid in, um, in Texas. He went and got an AR-15 on two different occasions and 350. 50 bullets and nobody stopped to think that maybe there needed to be some pause or maybe there needed to be some further. I just don't get it. I think that there's some common sense, basic things we can do and we're just not there. You said when Sandy Hook happened and there were all of those white children that got killed and nothing happened. Why do you point out that they're white children? I think that for a country that has uh, a true question mark on the value of certain lives and the the benefit of humanity. I think um, by bringing in that component and being extremely clear in the description thereof um, and saying that there's no question these lives matter, there's no question of the value of the sanctity of these lives, this is not in question at all. and we did nothing, I think that exacerbates and drives home my point. It also, Dr. Phil, in a probably decently um, cynical way, is decently sensationalized. I recognize that. It draws people to the sentiment, but it also points out a true fact that we did nothing after Sandy Hook. And I, I stand on the resolve that if we did nothing after Sandy Hook, we won't do anything now. Yeah. So your point is if you didn't do anything after those white kids were shot, they're sure not going to do anything if minority children are killed not after 70 percent hispanic community was shot up no so you don't have much hope that that's going to send a a message up the chain that says okay enough's enough too much is too much now's the time i hope i'm wrong but i mean do you have faith something i mean it's your show i don't mean to be posing questions no ask me anything you want but do you have faith that anything's going to change and if so what gives you what is that faith rooted in My hope is that at some point, there's got to be a tipping point where America says enough's enough and too much is too much. And if anything is going to cause the left and right to come together, then somebody that goes in and guns down innocent children. I mean, these children were nine, 10 years old. That to me is about the most cowardly, egregious thing you can do. And it just seems really hard to imagine that anybody from the far left to the far right could disagree that that is an absolute stain on our nation, that that is a horrible thing to keep happening. Like I said, it's 61 times in 2021. At some point, if there's a bipartisan issue, 
protecting our young people and our elderly seems to be something that everybody should find non-threatening and come together on. It just seems like if you're going to pick something, that would be a place that people could rally around. Dr. James Kimmel, Jr., a researcher at Yale University. Today, we're addressing the adverse physical effects that anger and revenge have on the brain and that the brain, therefore, has on behavior of some people. Research says that this anger, this retaliatory behavior, is just as addictive as opioids, making them extremely difficult to resist for some people that get into this loop. People need to acknowledge that this is an intersection between law enforcement and public health. I'm not asking cops to not arrest these perpetrators, because while this is a long-term solution and it is a prevention program, these people are a problem right now today. I did a episode recently with some folks that were talking about the fact that the real problem here starts in the neighborhoods. It starts with the upbringing. It starts with the lack of role models. It starts with all of the social influences and upbringing with these young men that were left with no alternatives, and so they made bad choices, and so they wound up in prison. And putting them in a cage for five years does nothing to help them. So that's why they support defunding the police. They just wouldn't understand that I agree with them completely that that's how they got from where they were to where they are. But if I have a home invasion and somebody is holding my wife at the business end of a shotgun, I don't give a shit what his childhood was like. I don't want a social worker to come right. explain to me how downtrodden he was. I want a cop to come in there and suppress the crime at the time. So I'm not excusing these criminals for their criminal conduct. And it's interesting when you talk to, for example, the business owners in the black community, they don't want less police. Right. They want more police better trained yes. to do the right thing. And I was saying, you don't want this cop to try to be a therapist, an analyst. You want somebody to come in and suppress the crime. Add someone to the team if you want somebody to come in and evaluate these issues. The Violence Project have developed an integrated, interdisciplinary understanding of violence and a holistic approach to addressing it. I've spent time recently with Dr. Redfield, who was the head of the CDC at the peak of the pandemic and transition between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, and Dr. Dimitri Christakis, who is a pediatric epidemiologist who has been really studying the effects of the quarantine, the shutdown of the schools on young people. Both of them are talking about the profound effects that the quarantine and the shutting down of the schools is having on our school population now, and that the cost is practically immeasurable, but that it's going to cost, the model suggests, 5.3 million years of life lost for these kids in school now because their academic attainment is going to be less, which means their employment success is going to cost them an estimated $17 trillion for this generation across time. And so it's a big predictor of longevity. Depression is higher than it's ever been measured since we've been measuring it. Anxiety is higher 
suicidal ideation attempts and suicide is higher, particularly for young women, but also for men. So mental health adjustment is really bad right now with depression and anxiety leading the problems and tremendous academic frustration because there are these gaps now. So they're facing all of this expectation for work they can't do because anywhere from five to 12 months of loss is going to push them further and further behind. Is this kind of problem and frustration likely to create bigger problems going forward in terms of playing out in the schools with violence of this type or other types? Yeah, I think we are at high risk right now. And, you know, we've seen it play out over the last year with Oxford and with Uvalde and even the Buffalo shooting and the Highland Park shooting. Both of those were 18 year olds who had just been through the pandemic being a you know high school student during the pandemic. We're seeing, I think, risk factors, things like you've been mentioning suicidality and hopelessness and depression spending increasing times online, those are all elevated because of the pandemic. And then you add into that record gun sales and just access within the home that I do think we have to take this very seriously. We can't only talk about this after a school shooting occurs. We have to keep talking about it in building these prevention systems. I think so long we've been focused on reacting. It's about minimizing casualties and training ourselves to minimize casualties. We need to prevent this from actually occurring. And that's going to take some real training and resources and commitment from all of us in schools, as parents, as community members. But it's really time to start working on it. Look at what we're facing now. Highest levels since records have been kept. We are at high risk. So we've got to dig in and figure this out. This is very high on my priority list. I visited Capitol Hill recently and talked to members on both sides of the aisle in the House and the Senate. They know that it's high on my priority list and they're listening. And I'm hoping soon we might jointly go talk to some of these people and see if we can get something done. Is there a state, is there a school system a region that you think does a better job that is kind of a leader in getting some of this together? I know Colorado has some reporting systems and all. Is there somebody that you think approximates leading in the direction that needs to be done? Yeah, Colorado has some really good systems in place. Um, The organization Sandy Hook Promise has an anonymous reporting app that about 2 million students use. And when they put in a concern, it goes to an actual crisis center that and it's responded to within a minute by a crisis counselor who tries to sort of figure out what that student needs at the moment. And I think that's the type of model we really need at the national level. And the hopeful thing is, I think, when we've studied averted shootings or kids who are on this pathway and changed their mind, sometimes the problem can feel so massive at the policy level but it really comes down to a human connection, right? It's someone connecting with them, like you were describing, someone putting their hand around their shoulder, somebody giving them a little bit of hope to get them through that moment and to get them the resources that they need. So in some ways, that is incredibly hopeful because that is something that we can all be doing for each other every day. Well, it's good that there are some examples out there. And we now have the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. It's not flawless at this point because people are being trained, but it is up and it is running. It's the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. It's got over 200 crisis centers that are open 24 hours a day. People sometimes can't remember the crisis prevention lifeline number, but they can remember 988. So, that's out there and it's getting more and more support and more and more activity all the time. I've been working with them on that and messaging on that. So we do have attention. People are paying attention to this on Capitol Hill. I hope you guys will continue to dialogue with me about this and hopefully we can go up there and talk to these folks and see if we can get them to lean into it. 
Absolutely. Yes.